Once I put this question to the Master. How many of the four or five hundred persons gathered here on this mountain have fully understood your reverence's teaching? The Master answered, Their number cannot be known. Why? Because my way is through mind awakening. How can it be conveyed in words? Speech only produces some effect when it falls on the uninstructed ears of children. What is the Buddha? Mind is the Buddha, while the cessation of conceptual thought is the way. Once you stop arousing concepts and thinking in terms of existence and non-existence, long and short, other and self, active and passive, and such like. You will find that your mind is intrinsically the Buddha, that the Buddha is intrinsically mind, and that mind resembles a void, Therefore, it is written that the true Dhammakaya resembles a void. Seek for naught besides this, else your search must end in sorrow. Though you perform the six parameters for as many eons as there are grains of sand in the Ganges. Adding also all the other sorts of activities for gaining enlightenment, you will still fall short of the goal. Why? Because these are karma-forming activities. And when the good karma they produce has been exhausted, you will be born again in the ephemeral world. Therefore, it is also written, the Sambhogakaya is not a real Buddha, nor a real teacher of the Dharma. Only come to know the nature of your own mind, in which there is no self and no other, and you will in fact be a Buddha.
knowing that the enlightened person who achieves the cessation of conceptual thought is Buddha, would not an ignorant person, on ceasing to think conceptually, lose himself in oblivion? There are no enlightened people or ignorant people. And there is no oblivion. Yet, though basically everything is without objective existence, you must not come to think in terms of anything non-existent. And though things are not non-existent, you must not form a concept of anything existing. For existence and non-existence are both empirical concepts, no better than illusions. Therefore, it is written, Whatever the senses apprehend represents an illusion, including everything ranging from mental concepts to living beings. Our founder preached to his disciples naught but total abstraction, leading to elimination of sense perception. In this total abstraction does the way of the Buddhas flourish, while from discrimination between this and that, a host of demons blazes forth. If mind and the Buddha are intrinsically one, should we continue to practice the six parameters and the other orthodox means of gaining enlightenment? Enlightenment springs from mind regardless of your practice of the six parameters and the rest. All such practices are merely expedients for handling concrete matters when dealing with the problems of daily life. Even enlightenment, the absolute, reality, Sudden attainment, the Dharmakaya, and all the others, down to the ten stages of progress, the four rewards of virtuous and wise living, and the state of holiness and wisdom, are, every one of them, mere concepts for helping us through samsara. They have nothing to do with the real Buddha mind. Since mind is the Buddha, the ideal way of attainment is to cultivate that Buddha mind. 
only avoid conceptual thoughts which lead to becoming and cessation. To the afflictions of the sentient world and all the rest. Then you will have no need of methods of enlightenment and such like. Therefore, it is written All the Buddha's teachings just had this single object to carry us beyond the stage of thought. Now, if I accomplish cessation of my thinking, what use to me the Dharma's Buddha taught? From Gautama Buddha down through the whole line of patriarchs to Bodhidharma, none preached naught besides the one mind, otherwise known as the sole vehicle of liberation. Hence, though you search throughout the whole universe, you will never find another vehicle. Nowhere has his teaching leaves or branches. Its one quality is eternal truth. Hence, it is a teaching hard to accept. When Bodhidharma came to China and reached the kingdoms of Liang and Wei, only the Venerable Master Ko gained a silent insight into our own mind as soon as it was explained to him. He understood that mind is the Buddha and that individual mind and body are nothing. This teaching is called the Great Way. The very nature of the Great Way is voidness of opposition. Bodhidharma firmly believed in being one with the real substance of the universe in this life. Mind and that substance do not differ one jot. That substance is mind. They cannot possibly be separated. It was for this revelation that he earned the title of Patriarch of our sect. And therefore it is written, the moment of realising the unity of mind and the substance which constitutes reality may truly be said to baffle description.
Does the Buddha really liberate sentient beings? There are, in reality, no sentient beings to be delivered by the Tathagata. If even self has no objective existence, how much less has other than self? Thus, neither Buddha nor sentient beings exist objectively. It is recorded that whosoever possesses the 32 characteristic signs of a Buddha is able to deliver sentient beings. How can you deny it? Anything possessing any signs is illusory. It is by perceiving that all signs are no signs that you perceive the Tathagata, Buddha and sentient beings are both your own false conceptions. It is because you do not know real mind that you delude yourselves with such objective concepts. If you will conceive of a Buddha, you will be obstructed by that Buddha. And when you conceive of sentient beings, you will be obstructed by those beings. All such dualistic concepts as ignorant and enlightened, pure and impure are obstructions. It is because your minds are hindered by them that the wheel of the law must be turned. Just as apes spend their time throwing things away and picking them up again unceasingly, so it is with you and your learning. All you need is to give up your learning, your ignorant and enlightened, pure and impure, great and little, your attachment and activity. Such things are mere conveniences, mere ornaments within the one mind. I hear you have studied the sutras of the twelve divisions of the three vehicles. They are all mere empirical concepts. Really, you must give them up. So just discard all you have acquired as being no better than a bedspread for when you are sick. 
Only when you have abandoned all perceptions, there being nothing objective to perceive, only when phenomena obstruct you no longer, only when you have rid yourself of the whole gamut of dualistic concepts of the ignorant and enlightened category, you will at last earn the title of Transcendental Buddha. Therefore is it written, your prostrations are in vain. Put no faith in such ceremonies. Hide from such false beliefs. Since mind knows no divisions into separate entities, phenomena must be equally undifferentiated. Since mind is above all activities, so must it be with phenomena. Every phenomenon that exists is a creation of thought. Therefore, I need but empty my mind to discover that all of them are void. It is the same with all sense objects, to whichever of the myriads of categories they belong. The entire void, stretching out in all directions, is of one substance with mind. And since mind is fundamentally undifferentiated, so must it be with everything else. Different entities appear to you only because your perceptions differ just as the colours of the precious delicacies eaten by the devas are said to differ in accordance with the individual merits of the devas eating them. Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi is a name for the realization that the Buddhas of the whole universe do not in fact possess the smallest perceptible attribute. There exists just the one mind. Truly, there are no multiplicity of forms, no celestial brilliance, and no glorious victory over samsara, or submission to the victor. Since no glorious victory was ever won, there can be no such formal entity as a Buddha. And since no submission ever took place, there can be no such formal entities as sentient beings.
yourself are a member of the Sangha now, obviously engaged in preaching the Dharma, then how can you declare that neither of them exists? If you suppose there is a Dharma to be preached, you will naturally ask me to expound it. But if you postulate a me, that implies a spatial entity. The Dharma is no Dharma. It is mind. Therefore Bodhidharma said, Though I handed down mind's Dharma, how can Dharma be a Dharma? For neither mind nor dharma can objectively exist. Only thus you'll understand the dharma that is passed with mind to mind. Knowing that in truth, not a single thing exists which can be attained is called sitting in Bodhi Mandala. A Bodhi Mandala is a state in which no concepts arise, in which you awaken to the intrinsic voidness of phenomena also called the utter voidness of the womb of Tathagatas. There's never been a single thing, then where's defiling dust to cling? If you can reach the heart of this, why talk? of transcendental bliss. If there's never been a single thing, can we speak of phenomena as non-existent? Non-existent is just as wrong as its opposite. Bodhi means having no concept of existence or non-existence.
At this very moment, all sorts of erroneous thoughts are constantly flowing through our minds. How can you speak of having none? Error has no substance. It is entirely the product of your own thinking. If you know that mind is the Buddha and that mind is fundamentally without error, whenever thoughts arise, you will be fully convinced that they are responsible for errors. If you could prevent all conceptual movements of thought and still your thinking processes, naturally there would be no error left in you. Therefore, is it said, when thoughts arise, then do all things arise. When thoughts vanish, then do all things vanish. At this moment, while erroneous thoughts are arising in my mind, where is the Buddha? At this moment, you are conscious of those erroneous thoughts. Well, your consciousness is the Buddha. Perhaps you can understand that were you but free of these delusory mental processes, there would then be no Buddha. Why so? Because when you allow movement of your mind to result in a concept of the Buddha, you are bringing into existence an objective being capable of being enlightened. Similarly, any concept of sentient beings in need of deliverance creates such beings as objects of your thoughts. All intellectual processes and movements of thought result from your concepts. If you were to refrain from conceptualizing altogether, where could the Buddha continue to exist? You are in the same predicament as Manjushri, who, as soon as he permitted himself to conceive of the Buddha as an objective entity, was dwarfed and hemmed in on all sides by those two iron mountains.
at the moment of enlightenment, where is the Buddha? Whence does your question proceed? Whence does your consciousness arise? When speech is silenced, all movement stilled, every sight and sound vanished. Then is the Buddha's work of deliverance truly going forward. Then, where will you seek the Buddha? You cannot place a head upon your head or lips upon your lips. Rather, you should just refrain from every kind of dualistic distinction. Hills are hills. Water is water. Monks are monks. Lay people are lay people. But these mountains, these rivers, the whole world itself, together with the sun, moon and stars, not one of them exists outside your minds. The vast universe exists only within you. So where else can the various categories of phenomena possibly be found? Outside mind, there is nothing. The green hills which everywhere meet your gaze and that void sky that you see glistening above the earth. Not a hair's breadth of any of them exists outside the concepts you have formed for yourself. So it is that every single sight and sound is but the Buddha's eye of wisdom. Phenomena do not arise independently, but rely upon environment. And it is their appearing as objects that necessitates all sorts of individualized knowledge. You may talk the whole day through, yet what has been said? You may listen from dawn till dusk, yet what will you have heard? Thus, though Gautama Buddha preached for 49 years, in truth, no word was spoken.
Assuming all this is so, what particular state is connoted by the word Bodhi? Bodhi is no state. The Buddha did not attain to it. Sentient beings do not lack it. It cannot be reached with the body, nor sought with the mind. All sentient beings are already of one form with Bodhi. But how does one attain to the Bodhi mind? Bodhi is not something to be attained. If, at this very moment, you could convince yourselves of its unattainability, being certain indeed that nothing at all can ever be attained you would already be Bodhi-minded. Since Bodhi is not a state, it is nothing for you to attain. And therefore it is written of Gautama Buddha, While I was yet in the realm of Dipankara Buddha, there was not a grain of anything to be attained by me. It was then that Dipankara Buddha made his prophecy that I too should become a Buddha. If you know positively that all sentient beings are already one with Bodhi, you will cease thinking of Bodhi as something to be attained. You may recently have heard others talking about this attaining of the Bodhi mind. But this may be called an intellectual way of driving the Buddha away. By following this method, you only appear to achieve Buddhahood. If you were to spend eon upon eon in that way, you would only achieve the Sambhogakaya and the Namanakaya. What connection would all that have with your original and real Buddha nature? Therefore, is it written... Seeking outside for a Buddha, possessed of form, has nothing to do with you.